Um, well, welcome to, to today's health plan outlook for 2024. And we're excited to share some perspective both from Baker Tilly and from, from United Health Group. Um, Paul, Paul will introduce himself in a moment, you know, and what we see coming you know, for the year ahead and, and in the years beyond as well as we get into the discussion today. So Stephanie, move us forward a slide, please. Um, I'll just introduce myself quickly and then we'll, we'll run around the horn here. Um, I'm Mike Patty. I, I run healthcare for the firm. So I'm the firm practice leader for the healthcare industry team. I My background though is in the payer space. So I, I've worked for health plans since at least 2005. Um, lots of experience with um, with all kinds of organizations, blue, blues plans, national national payers, and, and some of the regional plans alike. Um, you will see as we get into the conversation some of the subject matter that, that we bring to the table, um, but we'll focus on, you know, sort of the perspective of what's happening in the industry as we go. But you'll see, you know, some of the strengths of our team you know, as we get into the discussion topics. Dave, David, do you want to introduce yourself next? Yeah, sure. D- David Gregory, a, a principal at Baker Tilly, a Work uh, work with Mike uh, on a daily basis, as well as as well as Kevin, and, and very glad to have uh, Paul on board. Um, and uh, looking forward to today's discussion. I I'm a, I'm a former hospital administrator, former health plan administrator. Um, been consulting for providers, payers, and life sciences clients for uh, a good chunk of my career. I, I lead several service offerings here at uh, Baker Tilly, and looking forward to a uh, robust conversation on the the outlook for health plans on 2024 and beyond. Thank you, David. Kevin? Hi, all. My name is Kevin Coonan. Um, I am principal with with uh, Baker Tilling out of our Chicago office. Um, like Mike, most of my most of my times with with um, with health plan payer organizations, um, mainly in network management, provider reimbursement, value based care, Um, And then more recently, I've spent a a lot of time working on No Surprises Act and and some transparency in in coverage, um, both using the data and and compliance, um, which we'll talk a little about uh, in today's meeting. Very good. On behalf of Dan, Dan, Dan's not joining us today. So a quick um, game time schedule update. The abstract for the webinar today included some comments on accounting regulatory updates. We we just recently completed a, a meeting just like this one specifically to the financial services industry, which includes insurance and, and you know, all types of health insurance, as well as property casualty life and you know, other payer types. The content that we, that we had planned from an accounting update perspective is in that session. In the opening you know, minute there, you saw you know, where to get content from other Baker Tilly webinars. We'll share links with you know, interested parties after the meeting, but we wanted to make sure Dan's contact information was available you know, in the introduction here, but the content on the accounting you know, regulatory updates for the year ahead is available in that financial services material, and we'll, we'll share that with the audience you know, after the meeting. So I just wanted to make a quick comment on, on Dan's behalf there. Paul, Paul, please, um, maybe a quick introduction to yourself, but the role you play at United, you know, especially in, in that introduction. Great, yeah, so um, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I am a health plan CEO in United Healthcare's commercial uh, division. And I manage our group business for employers seeking health insurance or administration in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. Uh, Under management in those three states, we have over 1.2 million members. Um, And so I work uh, with employers uh, specifically. Um, As you're probably aware, United Healthcare has businesses um, nationally across the country. We're the largest health insurer. Um, We also have Medicare. Uh, business across the country, Medicaid. And then you're, I'm sure you're familiar with our Optum division, um, which uh, uh, is broad. Uh, we deliver health services. We own provider groups. We have Optum RX PBM. Uh, we have lots of different businesses that support all aspects of um, uh, provider administration as well as um, point solutions for specific conditions. So happy to be here today. Great, Paul. Th- thank you for joining us. And uh, sitting in the perfect chair to give us some insight into those outlooks for 2024 with you know, your role in the, in the scale of the organization. So thank you. All right. So just a couple of um, you know table setting comments for the agenda here. We're going to do this a little bit panel style. I'll, I'll try and you know prompt the team along um, with driving some questions. Um, we'll start with Paul talking about some of the things that United is looking at as the organization moves into 2024. And so we'll start kind of wide. We'll, we'll have a, an open-ended discussion on some of the bigger trends we see you know, from that lens and through that perspective. Um, and then we'll, we'll dive a little deeper. We'll, we'll get narrow as we move into you know, industry update 
digital transformation and cost containment. So we've got, we, we prepared, you know, some thoughts on those specific topics. Um, as, as we were preparing for the session today and, and talking about, you know, amongst each other on our experiences and our perspectives here, I think a lot of these topics are heavily interrelated. And so I think we'll see, you know, comments that we make early come back alive, you know, later in, in say, a, a transparency conversation or in a digital conversation. So, you know, another th sort of thought we had as we you know, prepared the topics here was, you know, in the complexity of, you know, the business today, in the strategies that health plans need to be deploying today, we're getting more and more sort of cross-functional connectivity and more and more sophisticated as we're driving trends. And so while we've got specific topics here, I, I do think that you'll see some of those big picture themes that Paul starts us off with will come to life through the specific details as well. So we're looking forward to sharing our perspectives on these topics. And, and again, we'll, we'll sort of dri drive this in, in facilitated conversation style. Um, if you have questions, you know, please throw them in. We'll do our best to answer live as we go. I, I don't guarantee we'll get to all of them, but um, as we said in the opening minute there as well, we will absolutely follow up after the webinar if we don't catch things live during the session. Um, maybe one more comment. The, we'll talk about providers um, a little bit along the way. And so, you know, transparency as an example is a regulation that, that hits, you know, both the payer side of the industry as well as the healthcare provider side of the industry. Different, different slightly different rules, um, slightly different aspects to be compliant in the regulation, slightly different strategic uses you know, of the information and the process around it, but, but certainly very related. I, one of our perspective is, is that you know, having an understanding of sort of all um, stakeholders in the ecosystem you know, strengthens our knowledge of you know, what any given stakeholder needs. And you know, David mentioned his background in provider and life sciences in his opening comments. You'll, you'll hear some of that in this discussion, right? We'll talk a little bit about what providers are doing as we think that's a great set of insight into what health plans need to be thinking about. So give us some latitude as we sort of move, you know, a little bit beyond health plans, especially into the provider community in the conversation as well. All right, panelists, any any other comments as we jump in um, to set the table? All right, uh, Paul, let's start with you. I, as we mentioned, we wanted to give you just a forum to talk a little bit about what, what's important to United as you guys look into 2024. What what strategic initiatives are you guys thinking about? What what sort of priorities have you set up for yourselves coming into the new year here? Yeah, so um, I'm going to start out very broad, just give you a sense of um, kind of what the mission is. And um, we help people live healthier lives and try to make the health system work better for everybody. That's that's really broad, but I'm sure everybody um, associated in healthcare understands how complex it is just about on every single level from the regulations to the actual transaction when a member needs any kind of care. Um, and so our focus is really on how do we simplify that experience? Um, and then uh, obviously cost is continuing to be an issue. Um, members can't afford their out-of-pocket portion even when they have insurance. Um, forget about it if they don't have it, that, that's uh, you know obviously a major challenge. Um, so we're focused on affordability, but um, I think um, the, the more that we can do to help that member understand um, the care that uh, they're seeking, um, how the insurance will cover that particular service, um, and then help um, them with any kind of question they have or gap in care, um, Anything that we can do to have that member have a better experience when they encounter the healthcare system, I think will lead to growth. Um, because currently, I think um, just about everybody is challenged when it comes to um, experience the healthcare system when they're sick or a family member is sick and they're under stress. So um, we're using a lot of technology, we're using a lot of um, expertise. Um, and I think if you look back 20 years ago when I, you know, uh, you know, there was much more of a peanut butter approach to a lot of engagement with both members and providers. And I think um, over time, the more we can specialize and tailor uh, services for both members and providers for their specific condition or their specific specialty where we can add value um, and provide them with relevant information specific to their condition, um, we're going to get a better outcome. And that includes people who are underserved. So folks who 
have challenges just accessing the healthcare system, they need a whole different level of uh, support that sometimes is even outside of United Health Group. So when you think about it, even those with means who can access it and have insurance have specific needs, and then those that can't, I think we're thinking about that holistically. How can we positively influence uh, the members in any community? Well, Paul, you mentioned along the way there that um, the, the system is complicated, right? Healthcare has got a lot of complexities. I, I heard a focus on affordability. I heard helping members better navigate care and understand their benefits. I heard specialized and tailor, ser tailored services to members and providers, a special focus on the underserved, but what a, what a capstone of the complexity in the system. There's a lot of, a lot of challenges to sort of tackle at once, but I certainly agree, you know, critical to success in the, in the environment today. Yeah, it's humbling. Uh, keeps us up at night. <laughs> For sure. Um, no shortage of challenges to focus on in our, in our positions. Uh, if I could get you to comment on one more thing, we, we talked a little bit about, you know, the merger environment in the landscape. There's some news, you know, in the last couple of days about a big national moving some of its, you know, business into one of the blues plans, but there's always headlines. Um, what, what's your outlook on the, uh, I know, the merger environment or the consolidations that are, you know, happening in the industry? Yeah, um, you know, that that is generally not my space just in terms of corporate development or M&A work. But, um, you know, uh, working in the commercial environment, understanding who our competitors are um, and just looking at, um, I guess, uh, things that are resonating in the marketplace, um, whether it be a capability, um, a specific um, value that a company has in a specific geographic area or um, level of service. Um, you know, I think it's it's like any industry, if there's a capability um, or a performance uh, that seems to be winning um, or would be an asset for a company, I think with the evolution of um, different technologies um, and expertise, um, there's still going to be value in acquiring an asset um, that could help you succeed in your business. Um, and, you know, because United Health Group is really spanning um, so many different areas in healthcare, um, there's a lot of value out there for, um, uh, you know, potential acquisition. Um, and so we're always monitoring that. And I think that, um, you know, most of our competitors are as well. So, um, if it's going to significantly improve our ability to achieve our mission, which is to add value, simplify, make it more affordable, I think you're going to continue to see um, acquisitions. Makes sense. Um, David or Kevin, before we dive into some of the more detailed topics, wanted wanted to give you guys a chance to react to any of the, the commentary Paul's made so far. Yeah, I, I I would react to the peanut butter comment. If I understand that correct, Paul, I, I, you know, I... And I'm pretty sure I do that, you know, kind of, um, uh, you know, kind of doing broad based um, interventions kind of uh, without, you know, too much specificity um, was kind of the, the way things were a couple decades ago. And, and, and we wholeheartedly agree that we see with the other health plans, too, that, you know, kind of getting down into um, more specific, um, uh, you know, patient engagement and, and programming that, um, is not even condition specific, but it's conditions specific, plural. Um, you know, that there, there are a lot of programs now that look at the confluence between different diseases. I, I always use the example of congestive heart failure and obstructive sleep apnea. I know that's getting very specific, but yeah. there's a bunch of patients out there that have both um, and, and they are sicker because of it. Um, and if you don't address both, um, you're not going to have a lot of success. And I, I think that's what you were referring to in terms of getting a little more specific about how you approach the, the population. So I'm kind of just agreeing that, you know, that's what we're seeing, you know, from from our lens as well. Um, uh, and then I had a question for Paul, actually. I, you know, Paul, uh, you know, a payer consolidation, for sure, you, you just address that. And, and it's OK if you don't really have a, um, a response on but provider consolidation. Uh, you, do you have a point of view on? kind of how that's impacting your side? Um, and, and do you see more of that coming? Do you think it's peaked um, in terms of providers consolidating uh, these days? 
Do you have a point of view on that? Yeah, um, you know, I'm not going to offer an outlook as to whether it's accelerating or decelerating. Okay. Um, but I, you know, it's it's still very uh, active out there. I mean, I know that there, uh, you know, there there is um, plenty of provider groups um, that are that we're seeing that are acquired by uh, different entities. Um, and so, from I, I guess from a payer perspective, what we're doing is we're analyzing. Um, you know, what is going to be the impact of that type of consolidation? So, uh, you know, I know any uh, managed care company uh, is closely monitoring yep. um, the run rate of uh, claims, um, utilization, you know, clinical indicators, et cetera. And uh, it does vary. Um, you know, so um the performance with specific health systems or groups can be very different. And so, um, you know, as there's more uh, consolidation, we have to be, make sure that we're nimble enough to understand what that means so that, uh, you know, when we're talking to our specific, um, you know, contracted providers in, in geographic areas, and maybe even those that aren't even contracted, and there may be a consolidation event we got to be ready to understand what that means. Uh, we have to understand what's embedded in our contracts with respect to what happens when that event occurs. And the bottom line is that uh, it's gravity. It's going to happen. Uh, we just have to make sure that we are able to react effectively to still continue to provide broad access and have it be affordable because um, when those transactions acquire, the numbers change and we got to make sure that we're on top of that. Mm -hmm. Great. I think um, we added layers to the complexity, right? As the discussion went on, the um, the, the plot the plot thickens. I, uh, if, if we can, maybe let's move into the next section if um, you guys are good with that. Um, as we as we transition, we wanted to get some audience feedback here. There'll be six of these you know, throughout the presentation today. Um, we'll, we'll try and be topical to what we're talking about you know, as we ask these polling questions. So we're curious, you know, in your organizations, if you had to pick one, I think that's the way the survey works. You can, you can pick one in the technology. Um, which which of these topics, um, or maybe it's another one not listed here, are, are most important or the highest priority for your plan um, in the coming year? You know, Mike, well, well, the polling question's going on here too. I, <clears throat> the, um, maybe taking a different turn, I mean, the mergers and, and acquisitions, both providers and, and payers, um, you know, can can create a lot of value, um, but it's also it's also complicated to merge companies, right? You've got you've got different states, different regulations, different systems, different processes coming together. And certainly, this is not a new topic for for consolidation across industries, but it's always a baseline level of work that that all healthcare payers have to take on in order, in order to you know to take advantage of the you know the consolidations. We'll talk about that a little more in digital transformations, but. Um, but certainly none of, none of those consolidations come without a tremendous amount of work. Agreed. Stephanie, do we have a poll answer? I don't know if you can speak, maybe just throw it in the, in the chat. Looks like we're able to move forward though. We'll, we'll fill you guys in on, on the answers as, as I get them on my screen here. I apologize. Um, we, 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 we're, we're a big fan of the technology we're using here. Some of the things are a little funky, um, in and access information while we're going live here. Um, all right, so we're flipping into the the second you know part of the agenda. Then the um, the the topic you know thematically is is a bit of a regulatory update. We've got three subsidiary topics in that section. So we'll start with transparency and coverage, or or price transparency. Um, I you know acknowledging that there's not necessarily a lot of regulatory um, change on this subject matter in 2024, although there's been several. Um, you know, re requirements to be compliant within the last two or three years. You know, maybe the theme here is transitioning from, you know, efforts to be compliant to beginning to use the information. Uh, Kevin, you spend some time in this space. Um, thoughts on what you're seeing um, in terms of health plans, I either maintaining compliance is certainly fair game, or, you know, efforts they're beginning to deploy to use, you know, the information now available to them through the, the transparency regulation of, of recent years. Yeah, I <clears throat> I agree with you. The I mean on the compliance end, I think the heavy lifting was done, you know, two years ago. And and there is 
certainly there, I mean, we can see that, that some payers are um, modifying or making adjustments to the, you know, the, the transparency data that they're publishing via their machine readable files, the MRFs. Um, but, but generally speaking, it seems like compliance is, 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 is been taken care of. And so now the question is, but we, we have seen, you know, we're two years on, we have seen year and a half on, we've seen an uptick in starting to use this data. Um, there are, there's half a dozen data aggregators out there that are pulling, you know, terabytes upon terabytes of data together into massive data sets, um, you know, both with the provider transparency and payer transparency, um, you know, to, to, to start helping, um, you know, groups make, make sense. Um, there are, there are other vendors out there that are, you know, reading that aggregated data and trying to trying to match, um, you know, the transparency data and make sense of it, converting it into percent of Medicare figures by MSA, by, you know, by provider, by payer, for example. Um, so, so we've seen, I, I think we've seen a, um, an increase in, in trying to use this data. And, and, and I mean, I, I don't, depending on who you talk to, the, you know, the, 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 the goal of the MRF isn't necessarily it's not for a consumer, right? The, some of the goal of the MRF from a payer perspective was to make use of it by um, various parties to shed some light on what the payments are and reimbursements are, you know, in, in healthcare. That, that's starting to happen. What, what's, um, or, or is maybe not even starting to happen, but it, but is starting to, to get much more traction. Um, so, so how are, how are payers using this data? I mean, on one on one token, many payers are using this in kind of a broad strokes kind of analysis, right? So they they might get questions from an employer group, or they might get questions um, from various places saying, "What what is our discount position in in this MSA in this rural MSA compared to United or compared to you know, Aetna or compared to the Blue Cross plan? What what's happening?" And so there are some. There are some tools out there that give some broad range estimations of of what's happening in those areas. <clears throat> now, those tools are limited by the fact that, back to the point about healthcare is complicated, reimbursement, provider reimbursement is also very complicated. There's multiple methods of reimbursement. There, the the, the files themselves are um, have challenges in in representing all of the information. Um, for example. Um, you know, high cost carve outs sometimes don't aren't represented well in in, in the data or, um, you know, hierarchical based pricing is not represented well in the data. So there are challenges, but there are there are folks trying to get some broad brush understanding of what of, of using this data. Now, I, I think what we're also seeing is that that there are um, and, and especially on the provider side, providers are asking, what is the what's the provider down the street getting paid? Um, you know, from 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 our from the, the same payers that pay us, um, and so payers are also starting to do more detailed contract negotiation analysis that says, okay, let's try to take a deeper dive and look at what am I getting paid? Um, you know, what are the what's the DRG base rate for my facility versus a different facility, or what am I paying this facility versus another insurance company? Um, so we're starting to get some more in-depth analysis. And remember, this this net this type of network reimbursement information was never available before. This is um, you know b- before two a year and a half ago. This was you know this was a closely guarded secret. So it's out in the open. It's not perfect, but but we're seeing we're seeing uh, stakeholders starting to use this data quite a bit more. And and we, our firm is even helping them you know do some of that and sifting through the you know sifting through the data to make sense. of it. There's a lot of great information there, Kevin. I, if I pick on one thing you said, you talked about you know, that data is maybe not the most, I'm paraphrasing what you said, but maybe not the most friendly for consumers. Paul, Paul you talked about you know, helping helping your members understand you know, the, the care choices they maybe should make and how it aligns to their benefits. I, maybe a reaction from you on you know, what, what are you guys doing with transparency information and are you using you know, the raw data required by the, by, the, by the regulatory environment or are you doing something else to um, you know, help shed that light on on your membership yeah so um you know we of course comply 
with um, all the requirements for transparency. We have to. Um, uh, we don't really have a choice on that. And, um, you know, so we, we have been in compliance. And I think that, um, you know, when, when that data becomes available, um, it's been confirming sort of what we thought our position was um, in the marketplace. And, uh, you know, over the years, we've had several different uh, vehicles to get an understanding of what we believe uh, our relative costs are from a discount perspective um, for all types of providers um, by participating in various, uh, you know, national consulting uh, data um, benchmarking projects, as well as looking at COB information that, that we have access to to kind of understand it. Um, and I think um, it, it's been more confirming. We haven't really learned anything that that was, um, you know, really uh, too different from what we thought. Um, but then you enter in the discussion with the providers and they have a run rate on their revenue, uh, you know, on their commercial business based on a composite of all their managed care contracts and they have their business realities. And I, I think that, um, you know, having better discussions with them about, um, you know, where we are relative to everybody else, um, as sure some of the other managed care plans are, I think that's a healthy discussion to understand why there may be differences and then what can you do about it are, are healthy discussions. But from a, you know, driving total cost of care, discounts are always very important. Um, but there are a whole host of other things that might impact ultimately total cost of care uh, for our customers that we're serving. We're only, you know, negotiating on their behalf and they're concerned about the total healthcare dollar. And so while transparency information is great for a health plan and maybe a consultant who has the capability to composite up those thousands of codes and get an understanding of what that relative position is, you know, at, at a member level, um, you know, it's almost impossible for them to get information about what's going to be the total cost for me uh, if I go to a specific provider because they're going to be billing multiple codes. Uh, they sometimes they don't even know what they're going to be billed, uh, and then they're not sure of you know specific coverage. So we've kind of leapfrogged ahead a little bit. Uh, from a consumer uh, standpoint and used a lot of the information about relative costs and quality um, towards giving members a better understanding of who's a high value provider in an area where they might have competitive fee reimbursements relative to some of the other options that might be multiples in terms of cost for the same service. Uh, and they have equal or better quality outcomes, um, we're trying to get information to members about what, what, what it will cost them in a very simplified way, and it's a product called Surus. So um, we're using a lot of analytics, including transparency inform information to understand what relative costs are per episode of treatment, and then we're trying to provide incentives to members with fixed or known costs for them uh, that will allow them to make a better choice with certainty. And so we'll give them an array of choices for their particular service with an array of copays if they utilize a specific provider that incentivizes them to use high value providers that are gonna result in higher quality and a lower cost. Uh, so Surus does that via copays We've also done a lot of work with a company called Garner Health uh, that understands that variation based on total cost um, and provides incentives for members to make better choices to reward them for using a, um, a provider that's just, quite frankly, getting better outcomes at a lower cost. That's great, Paul. I, I, I appreciate that comment on you kind of move beyond the information available in the raw you know, transparency files to features and you know, capabilities like you were just describing at the end there. It, maybe if I could tease out one more thing, I, what does that look like in the member experience? How how are you making that information available to them? And how how are they able to make that choice to you know, the, the better copay option or the 
a higher quality provider. Yeah, as simply as, as possible. So, you know, think about um, any other transaction uh, that's enabled through your, you know, your smartphone um, or, you know, in a simple display, which is using natural language to say, I need something um, like a knee replacement or an MRI and typing that in and then understanding what your options are for those specific services, uh, whether it be, um, you know, a, a specific provider, uh, which you'd get a, a literally a map with options for you to choose from and you touch it and you understand what your cost would be to go to that provider for that specific service um and get information and you you'd have the opportunity to see your options um in a specific geographic area for that particular service and then what's great about it is the member decides what they want to do whether they want to go to a specific provider at a lower cost share or a specific provider at a higher cost share all in they know what the, they know before they go what they're going to pay um and uh that that's how that member experiences other, um, uh, you know, retail experiences in their life right now, never really been possible in healthcare. And we think the more we can introduce that type of experience in healthcare, um, the, the customer, it's going to resonate and is resonating with customers made it simple. And, and individualized to their benefit plan and their, their specific circumstance on, on, on correct on their cost share their benefits it's awesome i maybe maybe one or two more questions in this area i i paul going back a couple of minutes you talked about you of course are compliant you need to be compliant i i don't know if this is fair or not do you have any sense of of the investment that you guys have made in achieving that compliance we we often observe the tens of thousands of files that that united's got posted on on your transparency website um i'm curious if you've got any insight to the effort the organization has undertaken to, to make that happen. Yeah, it's funny. You know, um, I think it's been incremental investment over a very long period of time. We had actually um, invested a lot pre uh, legislation to post, um, you know, the 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 fees, um, you know, our um, transparency tools that we had made available to our membership were already in effect prior to that legislation. So any member of United Healthcare, if they were seeking services, could literally go in and look at what our negotiated fee would be for that specific provider for that service. Um, as a matter of fact, we actually also feed in real-time information on their deductible and out-of-pocket um, uh, uh, expenses and could calculate that in so that I think United was prepared for this because we had already made that information available. We just needed to obviously take that same data set and then post it um, in the format required. But we had already had the capability to be basically manipulate that data um, to allow us to publish it uh, per the rec. So we were, we were kind of ready for that um, pre-law. Okay. Um, Kevin, you can probably tell us exactly how many files are out there. I think you perhaps ha. periodically browse that um, that site. I mean, each pair is some up, upwards of 50,000, 60,000 in some cases. It depends on how, um, depends on the kind of the unique, there's some, there's some decisions that each pair gets to make that, that all are generally compliant, but you can do it in different ways. But um, I e echo the point here. Um, you know the MRFs are 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 for are for machines and analysis resources and um, you know the teams that you know help contractors and sales and marketing teams and it's for it's for people who work in 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 healthcare right the the consumers um, you know clearly cannot use this data they they would need it simplified immensely as Paul was talking about in order in order to make decisions I mean what's a DRG, right? Uh, and, and so, um, you know, the reimbursement, for folks who understand reimbursement, know how to compare those things, normal consumers, that, that those, are, those, are, those are not concepts that, you know, they, they search on, right? So, um, 
but but I think the point is that you know the the data is out there. I 100% agree with you too, Paul. That um, it's important to corroborate this data with the normal sources, right? What are normal commercial benchmarks? It's important to to put the the payer uh, transparency data together with the provider transparency with the normal you know commercial benchmarks and 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 different benchmarks that have existed that folks were using COB analysis. And you kind of be, are able to triangulate in as to what you know what different groups are getting paid, but it's a you know it's still a powerful tool in the kind of contracting arsenal um, that that if if health plans aren't using they they should be. Great. I, I in the interest of time, I think we should move into the next topic. But Paul, a question came in. If you could repeat the um, the names of those partners you're working with on on the functionality you were describing. I'm sorry. Repeat the what. The names of the partner organizations or the te technology capabilities that are helping with that member experience on cost. Oh, oh, they're they're um, yeah. One is wholly owned by United Health Group, uh, United Healthcare, and that's the surest platform. That's a copay only plan. Um, we have our own operating system, and we're incorporating all of our data to basically tag copays to um, providers in our network, um, higher value. Providers have a lower copay, and um, a less uh, value would be a higher copay, and that's proprietary. The other firm is called Garner Health. Uh, they provide analytics on um, providers across the country, uh, and they offer an HRA product um, that offers members reimbursement for their out of pocket expenses if they take a uh, recommended provider from Garner Health. Um, so we partnered with them. We've got exclusive in several states, including the ones that I uh, manage in New Jersey, PA, and Delaware. And I think we've got, um, you know, a dozen other places where it's, uh, we have an exclusive with them, but they, they, in other states, they will partner with many organizations. Thank you. All right, Stephanie, let's move forward. Um, I, I think we're going to another polling question as we pivot from the payer side to the provider side. I, as you guys get a chance to take a look at this one, the, the previous poll um, landed on cost, you know, cost of care and discomposition being you know, the number one priority. But I, but I would say that there was a good spread of answers across you know all of, all of the items we had mentioned. So we had um, you know several really close to each other, but the cost of care rose to the top. Um, polling question two um, is focused on, on what we just talked about: transparency. How how are your organizations using price transparency files? Um, we've got the perspective here on you know in your network negotiations. I'm presuming that's like a number one you know, way to make this information helpful in, in the form it is you know, from the regulation, right? So um, avoiding Paul's comments on the more robust member facing capability, right? In the in the strict regulation, um, you know, using that information in network management. So we'd love to see you know, how your organizations are using transparency data. All right, if we can move forward while folks are populating the poll, David, we're going to flip over to the provider side. I think you mentioned you were a hospital administrator um, in your in your past life. Um, in, in some of your introductory comments, so we'll get our our requisite hospital um, leader into the dialogue here. What uh, maybe two questions to get you started? I, I think there's been a little bit more regulatory change recently for, for, for providers. Providers are maybe a year or two behind in the teeth in the regulation than payers have been. So maybe comment on that a little bit. And then what what are we seeing on our in the provider environment? Well, how are how are providers beginning to use this information? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. So it's uh, it's in contrast to the payer side that Kevin and Paul just presented. I mean, Paul basically started by saying we comply, period. Um, and, you know, nice and clean and and uh, and to the point the providers, you know, don't have that 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 two word, um, you know, period phrase. They you know, the providers are um, sometimes strategically not complying. Uh, sometimes non-strategically not complying, um, uh, but it is more of a patchwork. I, I, I definitely think there's more consistency on the payer side. I think the payer files are a little, a uh, little more difficult to, you know, to use and extract useful information from because of their size. But um, you know, providers um, are just now waking up with a new set of requirements, right? So I think um, it's important to understand that. The provider files are still, um, I don't want to say that they're holistically unreliable, um, but I do think that you have to be 
a lot more careful with the provider files than than you do with the payer files. And as Kevin said, we at Baker Tilly, we we do a lot of cross validation, right, between the payer files and the provider files for similar, um, you know, uh, providers, et cetera. Um, and so, and, and some of that cross validation checks out beautifully, right? But some of it doesn't. And and so, it's still a work in progress for sure. The the stats are that about. 70% of hospitals um, are complying at some level, um, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, but, but the, the expectation from CMS is that that number will go above 90% um, with a new wave of requirements that were just announced and approved at the end of 23. Um, and we've noticed in our client base that uh, our phone is ringing uh, with regard to hospitals that historically didn't take price transparency as, as seriously as maybe CMS wanted them to, uh, but now they are taking it seriously. Um, and it is because of this uh, late 23 uh, new requirement that kind of ups the ante, uh, uh, not only in terms of requirements and formats and things like that, but it also ups the ante in terms of, um, you know, penalties and, and the like. Um, and so, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the the provider community, um, I think, was as as Paul said, you know, you know, the, the rates have been out there for their for their members, um, you know, well before, you know, this law or, or executive order um, even came into being. And so it's it wasn't necessarily a new concept for some of the more established payers. But this was a hugely novel concept for almost all providers in the country. And some of them just couldn't do it. You know, they simply just couldn't get themselves to do it um, out of the gate. Um, so so 2024 is going to be a big year for price transparency compliance with regard to providers. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, like I said, I, you know, we should start to see, um, you know, that compliance rate go up above 90 uh, percent. You know, some of the new requirements uh, include things like. Uh, in the not just new formats, but also new levels of detail. Like we were saying before, it's difficult to decipher what some of the numbers mean in these files. But but now, um, you know, uh, implant carve outs and case rates and um, and global rates and, and things of that nature need to be better um, described uh, in these files, with the theory being that, it, you know, ultimately consumers have a better shot at understanding what's in there. I, I, I still think we're a couple steps away from it being consumer friendly. Um, but uh, these requirements are, 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 uh, are, are critical. And I, and, and many hospitals, I would say probably a, a, a third to, to 40% or more did not put their negotiated rates um, in their initial files from 21. And so for the first time in 24, uh, their negotiated rates will be um, you know, uh, you know, uh, seeing the light of day. Um, and, and that's a, that's a big leap, um, you know, for many of them, uh, their use and, 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 you know, I can, I can, you know, keep, uh, open it up here in a second, but the, yeah. the, the providers are using as, as I think Paul and Kevin said, I think, uh, both sides are, are trying to use these files to, to optimize negotiations and, and things of that nature. Um, although the providers really can't navigate the payer files. I, I think the payers, uh, our experience is the payers can certainly go in and look at the provider um, files, um, although the payers are prone to kind of, you know, not necessarily always pulling the right information. Um, and so, you know, therein lies the kind of the work in progress um, for sure. But they are being used for benchmarking and, and other things, which was, of course, not the intent of the of the original um, conception of this um, of this requirement, um, but but certainly I think as we've already concluded, right, both sides are using it um, in a pretty significant way for for benchmarking and for trying to optimize um, managed care contracting from from both sides of the house. But but a different, you know, just a completely different story on the on the provider side in terms of level of compliance and consistency of compliance. Um, et cetera. The last point I'll make is, is that accuracy is now on the table. I, you know, um, and, and this is, you know, I, I kind of draw the analogy to, to value-based care. When value-based care first came out, it was kind of pay for reporting. It wasn't really pay for performance. It was pay for reporting. You, you could report, you know, that, that everybody did terribly, um, but you would, you would actually get a bonus because you reported it. 
Um, and, you know, uh, and, and with regard to these, um, with regard to, you know, these files, um, there was initially, uh, you could potentially just put almost anything um, into the rate cells of these files and, and, and potentially be considered to be compliant the way compliance was being defined. Now in 2024, we are, um, we are you know, basically getting to the, um, uh, to the point of where CMS can actually audit based on accuracy, right? That, you know, they, they literally could ask for a managed care contract uh, and then go in and see, you know, whether or not there's, uh, uh, you know, there's accuracy with regard to the contract versus the file. So, so the, uh, the ante has been upped uh, quite a bit with regard to providers and the providers have definitely stood up and listened. Um, and our phone is ringing because of it. Um, and, uh, and I think that's the, that's the primary outlook for 24 is a lot more compliance. David, appreciate that. Maybe it's a good opportunity to capstone what came back on the survey with question number two. I, you know, in, in round numbers, 45% of the audience indicated um, the payers are either using these files on a limited basis or they're thinking about beginning to use them, right? So just under 50% in some you know, early stage of use. Um, less than 20%, you know, using them um, wholeheartedly and then other people not not there yet. Um, so, um, you know, that that's what that survey showed. I Your, your comments on, you know, the, the increasing use in managed care, you know, certainly resonate. Paul, I wonder if you have any anecdotes to share on, you know, providers bringing, you know, this data into conversations um, as, as your organization is, you know, running the managed care play and, and this information is now available to the network providers. Yeah, I mean... Certainly, there's been instances where a provider has pointed towards transparency data um, to compare what um, they're getting versus some of the other uh, competitors in a specific marketplace. Um, and, um, you know, you, you, you just have to deal with that um, as one of the components in a very complex negotiation, because as you're aware, there are a lot of other variables that really dictate ultimately um, what revenue that entity is going to yield from a payer, uh, from outlier pr provisions to um, you know, payment integrity to various other components, uh, certainly an important aspect of it. Um, you know, and I, I will just sidebar a little bit that, you know, um, we have found auditing our own contracts and loaded rates versus what's out there and found some of that data not to be accurate based on what we know we're actually reimbursing. And so, um, you know, we, we proceed with caution on it. Um, definitely can be instructive. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's going to evolve and, um, you know, ultimately, um, you know, as it gets more accurate, obviously, uh, it will be used in, uh, to an increasing degree by both parties. But I think both parties at this point, um, you know, are doing their due diligence to put a confidence level around what they're looking at. And um, <coughs> that varies dramatically by geography and by facility. A piece of the puzzle, but other yeah. factors to consider. That's right. Um, guys, last call for comments on, on transparency? No, it is. You know, it hasn't dramatically changed the landscape yet, but it, it, it'll probably be, become the new normal in the next five years or so. I, everything in healthcare takes longer than, you know, than you think it's going to. But I, I, I do think it'll be become kind of a reliable part of the fabric of negotiations. It's just not there. Right. As, as Paul just said, but maybe three to five years from now, um, it'll it'll be something both sides can rely on and and, and maybe allow a focus to be more on quality instead of rates. Uh, we. We've been trying to shoot for that for decades to, you know, to get the negotiation off of rates and onto quality, um, yep. uh, you know, to be determined as, as to whether this contributes to that. Great comment. All right. I, let's move into regulatory, regulatory topic three out of three. Um, we'll get the question going, you know, while Kevin starts to speak here. But um, we're going to talk about the No Surprises Act, um, you know, more specifically within the broad NSA. We're talking about, you know, the qualifying payment amounts and the, the various treatments, you know, applicable for out of out of network providers and um, you know how we're how we're reimbursing them, how we're calculating member cost share, right? All the all the boy, here's the next stack of complexity, um, you know, in terms of how this regulation affects you know transactions and relationships in that space. 
maybe, maybe Kevin will start with you. Um, you've been up to your eyeballs, I think, in in the NSA. Uh, maybe a couple of thoughts from your perspective on what's changing, you know, in an NSA as we look into 2024. Yeah. Um, so maybe maybe a few facts. There was a there was a recent survey that was just released by AHIP and um, and Blue Cross Association. Um, so in in 2023, last year, well over 10 million uh, surprise bills were avoided. Were patients were protected for what from well over 10 million uh, sub, surprise medical bills based on the uh, under the No Surprises Act. So. Um, that's that's one percent of, of of all um, of all encounters out there. One percent of claims. Um, so pretty pretty significant. Um, Eighty percent of those um, were were, were uh, resolved without going to this independent dispute resolution process or the IDR. Um, so they eighty percent resolved before that. That's actually more than was originally anticipated. Um, the, the amount of IDR usage by that was estimated by federal agencies was um, considerably less. It's 10 times more um, are going to IDR than originally planned and the um, or estimated. And the number seems to be ticking up. So um, IDR continues to be used, continues to draw. Um, I don't know. I <laughs> the different stakeholders are not that happy with how how well how smoothly or not smoothly the IDR has gone. Um, and then and then lastly, with some facts that came out of that survey, 60 per, 67 percent, two thirds of payers had uh, increased the sizes of their provider networks um, in some part due to the No Surprises Act. Um, no, no payers have decreased the sizes of their networks and, uh, and the third stayed the same. So seems to be potentially, although it's hard to create a causal relationship, but it seems to be increasing the size of provider networks, um, at least in part. Um, so I, I, let's see, the, the, the challenges. So the QPA, the qualified payment amount, this is the reference amount um, on which the, the, you know, the, the member co-pays and co-insurance are based. This has faced considerable scrutiny. So there was, a, there was a, a, a lawsuit last year from the Texas Medical Association, um, which um, appears to... to um, you know, to 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 be uh, different payers need to, uh, payers across the country need to follow the 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 results of that ruling. Um, it mostly res, um, is related to inclusion of um, only services that can be provided by a particular healthcare professional. So the elimination of the so-called ghost rates. Um, it also should include you know other types of payments and non-claims based payments like value-based care or bonuses, penalties, risk, other risk sharing um, type of agreements. Um, and, 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 more, and more details on, on provider specialties. So the payers went through tremendous work, um, you know, calculating their, their qualified payment amounts. They're gonna have to not go back totally to the drawing board. That's not the case, but, but, but some, some updates to the, to the QPAs over the next you know, six months or so to comply in quote unquote good faith um, with with the rulings that you know that have recently come out. All right, I appreciate those comments, uh, Paul. I, what do you see in in the IDR process? I, you smiled a little bit when Kevin made his elegant comment about stakeholders not being thrilled with it. I think you've talked about some data coming across your desk um, from that. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 here's where I'll I'll start out. I mean, I think you know we talked about a complex system and you know members being confused best thing is to have an in-network experience right and so we are going to try to the best of our ability have the broadest possible network to give members choice and just a better experience when it's in network uh kind of take them out of that um that process as well for providers i mean i'm sure um you know they would prefer a more seamless experience to get paid. And that certainly is the case when they're participating, but there are reasons they're not, right? So, um, you know, we found that, uh, you know, with IDR, um, you know, with the portal being down, um, you know, uh, several times, um, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a big backlog. Um, you know, just to give you an idea of the scale of this thing, um, United nationally, you know, we're, we're looking at over a million 
different IDRs. Hmm. Um, and uh, what we found, you know, uh, it, it is, we're seeing most of the claims from professional providers, primarily ER, RAD, anesthesiology. Um, and I'm sure that's no surprise. Uh, but what we're finding is because, you know, essentially they have an email address that they can submit information to, um, we're finding we're getting emails that have anywhere from 500 to 12,800 different claims in a, in a in an email. Um, and what we're finding is that uh 28% of those are not even eligible for IDR. Um, you know, after, and, and again, that's just based on our, our assessment. I'm sure the providers have a different perspective, but um, what, it, what that has led to is um, just a lot of administrative work on our behalf um, to actually mine through and understand, um, you know, what is eligible, what isn't eligible, and then get through that kind of volume. So, um, you know, I, I, we got to get through it. Um, but again, we're, we're um, facing tremendous volumes and um, trying to do our best to respond, um, you know, within the time frames and be compliant with the entire process, which um, we are doing. Um, I think that uh, it is very instructive, though. Uh, to take a step back and look at the outcomes of those IDRs, because when you're managing a network and you're um, looking at your out of network utilization and what's happening in the IDR process, uh, you can learn a lot about um, specifically, um, you know, where you can enhance the network or where you can reach out and have a dialogue with a provider that, um, has submitted an IDR to hopefully have a discussion, you know, potentially to get them in network with a little bit of a different lens and um, just understanding of what's happening. So you mentioned networks have grown. Um, I think there's been, um, you know, probably on both sides, a realization that after going through this arduous process that takes a lot of time and getting a yield at the end of the day, um, would it be better if we just got together and had a network uh, contract that we could both live with. So I think it's a continual, you know, process of learning. Uh, you got to, you know, compulsory to stay compliant, get through it. Um, there's been a ton of volume, but I think it's going to continue to evolve. And hopefully, uh, you know, we'll get to a point where, um, you know, we, we better understand each other in terms of um, the out of network payment, um, where we can minimize the number of IDRs that are submitted. And I think that's better for everybody. All right. If I try to put a capstone on it, let me know if you all disagree or agree. I, uh, clearly some growing pains in the early days of transacting downstream from regulation. Um, some moving pieces on, on the calculation methods for how, how we're valuing these claims, and which, which claims qualify, you know, how the dispute process works. Um, so some, some growing pains. And on the flip side then, you know, some driving towards good behavior on, on you know, provider network expansion and and some some members being protected, right? Which is which is the base you know purpose of the rule. So I so I think positive, um, but certainly chunky um, as as this one's in its earliest days of, of production launch. All right, getting some head nods. I let's move on to the next topic. So we're if you're following the breadcrumbs on the bottom of the side there, we are. 60% through the topics. Let's see, guys, if we can do some digital transformation topics in, um, in say, 15 minutes, and then we'll talk about cost, cost of care and cost containment in, in the next 15 minutes, just to time cop us all a little bit live here. Um, we'll start with a polling question like we did last time. So, you know, looking to get your insights on, you know, is your organization, I mean, I, I mean digital transformation is surely the reality of every participant in this industry, right? The complexity theme we've talked about already, you know, and or the emerging requirements, um, new products, new member facing capabilities, right? There's a technology um, project probably around every one of those corners. Um, so we know we know that the, the, the um, industry is often making these investments, but but those projects are hard, right? So we're, you know, we've got the question here on, you know, are you consistently successful, often successful, you have inconsistency with your attempts to transform your organization and bring digital capability to it. Um, so um, think about that polling question. 
while we get started here. Kevin, maybe maybe I'll pitch to you first. Um, Paul Paul's done some descriptions of what what sounds like some really sophisticated functionality. I mean, member member cost information specific to their benefit plan, the service they're about to receive in natural language to help them make a, a care choice. I mean, that's that's complicated stuff. Well, well, give me give us some opening comments on um, you know our experience with or your point of view on on digital transformation. Sure. I mean, um, I guess first thing I'd say is. Business transformation and digital transformation projects seem to be on everyone's mind, on all health plans' mind right now. Um, there's there's industry, there's other industry, you know, you know, trend sessions that have gone on for you know 2024, and 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 this topic is is always at the top. Um, as well, advanced analytics and AI is on everybody's mind. How can we take advantage of that? Um, and so in 90% of companies of, of health plans are planning to invest uh, more than they did in prior years on, on business transformation and, and digital transformation projects. Um, you know, that, that's on, 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 you know, spot goals as well as, you know, some of these, some of these larger, larger um, initiatives. Um, we've also got inflationary workforce costs. We've got healthcare cost pressures. There's a lot of reasons that, you know, trying to to work on these large projects is on top of mind. Um, you know, but one of the one of the trends I think that that we're seeing we want to talk about is the the increasing levels of cross functional integration. And Paul, I think you you mentioned it earlier, right? We're talking about when we when we talk about building some of the you know the capabilities that let's say enable members to have you know more empowerment over their care. Think, think about how many systems were in different um, areas, functional areas within a health plan we're talking about. I mean, network functions, sales and marketing, membership systems, we're talking about um, provider systems, provider quality, uh, potentially value-based care capabilities. Um, we're talking about a lot of different business processes, uh, technologies, different areas within a health plan that need to come together, and that, and and not only that, we're we're so 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 then we're talking about multiple stakeholders coming together. That that creates challenges with funding. I've I've seen clients that have, boy, we were trying to get a, a large, um, you know, digital transformation project going, but who owns it? Is it is it the is it the network? Is it sales and marketing? Um, and so we're seeing that you know a lot of these big initiatives you know, really need some executive backing, um, you know, to be able to push them forward. And then, and then there's hard decisions to make. How, how do we, how do we operate these, you know, these cross-functional capabilities? Um, how do we build them? Um, and so I, I think one of the themes of this year is an increase in, you know, in the, in the collaboration, you know, across the different functional and technical teams, you know, at, at, at health plants. I don't know, Paul, if you're seeing some of those seen some of those that you know with united and and with the op optum teams that are that are helping you know enable the the, the tech and the processes yeah oh a absolutely so um what's what's great is there's a lot of great solutions out there um and um you're right uh generally it starts with a value prop of what what is that solution aiming to achieve um, you know, to better outcome for a member, uh, you know, easier uh, for a provider in terms of, um, you know, a program um, or a set of programs. Um, and then you, you're right, you have to get the, the multi-stakeholders uh, because, um, you know, it, we have to think about what is the experience or, or what are we inserting into the process and, um, you know, if it requires a different uh, um, claim adjudication, uh, you know, can that get programmed? If uh, it requires a prior authorization, um, does that system, can, can that um, ingest that? And so I think, um, you know, uh, basically what we do generally with these is any kind of initiative like that, um, you know, we have a, a pretty... I, I think formal process to go through, through and vet it, understand what the ROI would be along with all the investments that it would take cross-functionally 
Uh, and if it grades out where it's going to be a significant ROI from a cost perspective or significant enhancement to a member experience or provider experience, uh, we're going to go for it. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think that that pipeline uh, you need to manage with some discipline uh, to understand because, you know, a lot of times, you know, there could be a barrier along the way. You know, if, if a certain functional area just doesn't support it or can't support it, it's going to die. So a lot of times um, I think uh, getting the right people uh, involved from the start to understand what can advance, uh, you know, is critical. Paul, Paul, you are, are you down. seeing, Oops, sorry. Are, no, I, I was just going to ask, are you seeing, um, you mentioned ROI, certainly all projects need an ROI and ROI and benefit analysis. Um, that can be a little tricky though, in, in, in certain cases, how do you, how do you value the, um, you know, the, the, the value to members or the, um, you know, the, 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 like the case for certain cost reduction may be a little more straightforward, but there are certain intangibles that, you know, I can create analysis paralysis for yeah. what we've seen for some of our clients. It's, it's hard to value. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. And I, and I, I just think you have to, um, you know, as you develop your business plan every year, is it meeting a key objective of this business plan, whether that's improving your net promoter score, uh, simplicity, um, you know, provider relations that, you know, those intangibles, you know, obviously those are debated. Uh, if, if, if it isn't, you know, a clear, you know, uh, ROI, if you will, and it's a little bit softer, I think it just has to align with the organizational priorities. Yep. Kevin, great minds. I was going to ask the exact same question. <laughs> That's perfect. Um, I, Paul, you were, we, in a past conversation, you were talking a little bit about, um, I, I would say, like, I would use the phrase carve out network providers, right? So if you've got carve out contracts in place with someone, someone to provide a specific service to the membership in a specific disease state or a, a specific area, um, I think you guys work with a lot of those. Maybe you've talked about some of your digital capability and in member experience, you know, um, in that mm -hmm. world. Um, if you could comment on on that a little bit, I think that's another great example of of the the value that this capability can bring to an organization. Yeah. So um, just to give a little bit of context here, you know, clearly, you're if you're delivering an insured product, um, you you have to have core competency for uh, increasingly, I think, specialized um services for providers and members uh to in, to uh ensure that they have a better experience and that you're uh, delivering those services as uh you know affordably as you can so you start amassing capabilities you know whether it's a specific behavioral health department or pt management um you know on and on um and so i think every health plan has core capabilities um, we deploy those core capabilities uh, to our, our clients, both fully insured and then self-funded. Um, with the rapid pace of development with point solutions that seem to be resonating in the marketplace, uh, United Health Group made the decision that if there are extremely effective point solutions that, that our larger clients find of value, um, we actually uh, can have made the decision to actually ingest, if you will, um, and connect electronically to enable that client to have that point solution. Like but, something like Limbongo, for example. Correct. You know, it could be lifestyle. You know, we're talking, you know, or Quest for biometrics uh, testing or Noom for weight loss management mm -hmm. or, you know, Hinge Health for um, musculoskeletal to uh, Teladoc to Maven, you know, there's a, there's a lot of Livongo. There's, there's, there's a lot of different point solutions that are resonating in the marketplace. And um, what we've done is we've approached those organizations and said, you know, if you want to serve your customers better and United Healthcare is the administrator, would you consider um, sharing data with us and we'll share data with you so you can serve your members better uh, to the point where, you know, if a client has a point solution, 
uh, that they like, and we've got an agreement with that point solution, um, we can actually make that member experience better because that point solution will be embedded into the United Healthcare app um, for that member when they're accessing information about their health plan or when they're logging in on their computer where they have one-stop shopping. I think um, you know it's frustrating for anybody uh, that has experienced their health insurance and they've got to go to several different websites, whether it's a PBM or a point solution, they have to reauthenticate. they have to go to another app. It just decreases um, the connectivity and the opportunity to engage with a member. So um, if you can put it in one place and present it that way to employees, the employer finds much more value in that. They're going to get much more out of their point solution. We'd love for it to be um, you know, one of our own solutions that we offer through our core offerings. But if they're married to it and they're very happy with it, um, we've made the decision that we'll allow that type of uh, integration um, uh, if the employer wants it. And uh, we're, we're finding that's resonating in the marketplace uh, much, much more effectively. So, um, so you've got you know, the value exciting. of the, you got the value of the point solution, but the but the, but it's a united experience. Um, wrapped above it. Yeah, it's it's still branded with that, uh, you know, that particular point solution. But, you know, to the member, it's their health and it's part of the health insurance package. And it just makes it easier for them uh, to get to who they need to get to for uh, services. Awesome. I, my wife and I signed up for Noom on January 1st. I'll have to go check my benefits and see if I can get reimbursed. I'm, <laughs> I'm down 10 pounds in 31 days. I am starving, um, but but I, a little shout out for Noom. I'm having a, a positive personal experience in the last four weeks there. Um, good good to hear that one in your in your repertoire. Uh, I, in the interest of time, let's let's move to topic four. Um, I, David, you're up. We'll, we'll get we'll get the polling question as we've been doing to start the conversation. Um, as you know, just as a capstone for the last question, I, 7% often successful on digital transformations. Um, you get, we get to 33% when you get um, to often successful, consistently first and often second. Um, so just echoing the concept of this work is hard, right? They're the Whether it's multi-divisional or multifunctional or third-party integration, I uh, we recognize the challenges in those digital transformations. I think the survey results um, did as well. Um, so just capstoning that last section. Um, David, maybe creating a connection to the first polling question, I, the number one answer was cost of care. Um, you spend a lot of time in that world. Uh, maybe get us started here with a couple of thoughts on you know, what's going on in, in 2024 from a, a cost pressure perspective and, and what, what you think plans you know, might be doing about it. Yeah, uh, sure. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, try to, I'll try to keep it tight here with, uh, with, with our time. Um, slowly uh, ticking down, but I, it's just interesting. I, I can't resist, but on, on that last polling question, Mike, uh, I think about a third are saying either very, very successful or um, mostly oh, successful. That That's actually a high number to me. Uh, you know, transformation projects are, are not, not easy. So it's just interesting that uh, uh, that, that number came out so high on that last polling question, but um, yeah, so, so cost of care. Um, so, you know, you can see here on the, on the slide that, you know, certainly, um, the challenges remain, I mean, these challenges have not changed all that much, right? I mean, high cost patients, uh, high cost services, high cost treatments, um, you know, are all wrapped into one big complex ball of yarn, right? That, that, that payers and providers and even med tech and pharma companies are trying to unravel in a meaningful way, right? With, uh, with, you know, with things that Paul's been talking about in terms of engaging the members um, better and, and patient compliance, we, we have not called out patient compliance and maybe Paul, uh, just a quick heads up that I'll maybe ask for a comment from you on how all this stuff we've been talking about today um, is impacting patient compliance. Because I, you know, I mean, there's statistics out there that three quarters of us, um, I guess Mike Patty's in the 25% right now. Hey, He's for four weeks, five, four five, what's that? It's only been four weeks. Don't don't. don't yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. So, but it's a but it's a point in time, Mike. So so you know, take it take it while you got it. Um, but you know, I mean, most of us are are not doing what the doctor wants us to do. You know, statin prescriptions go largely unfilled in in certain regions, right? And um and, and it's a bit of a mess uh, out there. And 
And, and so, you know, certainly, you know, uh, we, I think a lot of the things that we've been talking about today, um, you know, at its core, it's trying to promote patient compliance and get people to understand their health a little bit better um, and to take more control of it. And it sounds like Paul United is, is kind of empowering members to, you know, to make decisions they want to make that are good for them, uh, as opposed to having an insurance company uh, impose a decision on them. And so I, you know, um, so we'll give you the floor here in a second, um, you know, to kind of, you know, corroborate that for sure. Um, and then, you know, um, the, the other challenges being evidence supported payments and coverage and settings of care. We, we also haven't talked about that. I, 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 you know, it'd be interested to hear the panel's reaction to, I mean, we're trying to push everything into the home, right? I mean, we even got hospitals at home now, right? And, and we, we haven't brought that up, but there are, you know, several hundred, um, you know, Mayo Clinic is betting that, you know, 40% of their patients uh, will have some part of their inpatient stay at home, um, you know, in, in 2025. That's a, that's a big, hairy number, um, you know, to, you know, to have in the, in the home environment when, when historically they've been in an inpatient intense setting. Right. And so, um, you know, but so the, the industry is taking on some of these challenges for sure, but, um, but it's still, you know, a lot of it is, is a work in progress, but I, but I think almost everything we've talked about today on the solution front, um, you know, things like avoidance of consumer and provider abrasion. I think, um, again, we might put Paul on the spot for a minute about, um, abrasion, you know, there's a lot of abrasion in our system, right? And, and uh, it's all about reducing that abrasion uh, and empowering members, um, and which is that middle point there. And then that last solution, um, and, and I realize I just went through this quickly, but want to leave time for the interaction. Um, the, what I had mentioned before, integrated program management, there's been too much, there's been too much care management siloed, um, you know, obstructive sleep apnea. We got a, We got a thing for that. You know, we got a thing for congestive heart failure. We got a thing for pain management. We got a thing for behavioral health, right? You know, but, but all those things are not necessarily coming together um, and helping the patient manage, you know, multiple conditions, right? I think we're getting there. Um, but I, but I do think that um, there, there, there's more and more kind of integrated programming, you know, to recognize that the patient holistically you know, has more than one problem. Um, and most, most of us do. Um, and uh, if you just treat one or the other and, and not both, we, we know, we know how that, you know, how that uh, works for sure. So, um, so those are kind of my headlines, but I, I guess, you know, um, maybe Paul, if I could, you know, just um, ask you to, uh, you know, maybe to talk about the abrasion a little bit and, and, uh, and, and maybe some of the things you've already talked about would, would, would address that, but the, the, you know, the notion of United, that's one of your overarching objectives, I think, is to, is to reduce abrasion. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think there's any industry business that is really going to thrive in advance uh, with significant abrasion and things are going to change whether uh, that company wants to or not. But um, if there's too much abrasion there, uh, I don't think you, you're, you're going to have success long term. So, you know, one of the things we're doing is constantly assessing how can we add value into the system, um, you know, while still uh, focusing on the consumer experience and cost. Uh, you know, example of an assessment of that is we reduced our prior authorization um, requirement by about 20 percent last year after evaluation of, um, you know, were they actually moving the needle at all um, or was it an added layer that was unnecessary so went through that process reduced them dramatically um, are working on a gold carding program um, you know e expansion where we've got certain providers that they don't need to prior off anything because their track record is so strong we'll continue to monitor that uh, that's going to be that's not a just one and done we'll look at it uh, we think it's moving in the right, right direction to continue to analyze what makes sense and what doesn't. Um, but, you know, significant step there. But I think it's getting alignment in advance with providers around value-based programs where, uh, you know, or a bundled payment 
where we already have agreement up front about kind of where, how are they going to manage that patient? What are the types of things that they're going to do? The more we can do that, um, you know, we're going to reduce abrasion. But at the same time, I think we have an agreement up front and a line set of expectations, Dave, and you referenced before, you know, you know, we've, people got rewarded for reporting, right? Um, and maybe they had bad outcomes or they got paid just because they reported it. I think our ability to go deeper um, and make that easier as well. Um, you know, the uh, providers have many, many different payers, many different prior auth rules, many reimbursement uh, rules, all, all of that make it difficult. And I think the more we can do to streamline, you know, for example, we're deployed, we have, we have a, a program called point of care assist that's deployed in over, it's about 675,000 provider offices. Um, you know, that, uh, you know, if they've got uh, one of the major EMRs, um, you know, Athena, Cerner, Epic um, and others, um, we can actually provide information provided they they want it and they select what they want us to feed in there we can feed in a lot of information about a patient um, to them uh, we can also grab information so um, they're getting a more holistic view of information that we may have on that patient uh, that they have um, access to and then as they're making decisions about that, patient care, um, you know, let's say they want to prescribe a service and there is, there is a prior authorization attached to that. If they've linked up with us in point of care assist, sometimes we grab information from the EMR and it's auto approved, for example, and we can reduce that, um, you know, that, that work, that encounter, uh, because we've got that information. So I, I think that, um, you know, the, the more we can align up front, the better um, up front and do that work and then streamline it, the more success we're going to have because you make it too difficult for any type of program, um, you know, whether, whether it's a sleep program or not, if, you, if just the administrative process to engage in that program is difficult, you're not going to get the type of adherence that you want. And so making sure you're making it easy for the office administrator and the doctor to actually engage in the program is what it's all about. And, and technology is an ex extremely important part of that. And then all, also offering resources to wrap around those programs where they can pick up the phone, whether it's the member who's engaged in the service to, to specially support them with their multiple needs um, or the provider office to help support them as they engage with us. I think it's a combination of everything. It's the technology piece. It's the support piece. It's the contract up front. And when you get all those three things, you advance that positively, you're going to get better success. So nice thread connecting several themes, Paul, the, um, you know, the member experience in there, the avoidance of abrasion, the improved you know, cost and outcome, the digital capability required to pull it off, right? Another example of you know, all these themes sort of hitting each other together. Yeah, and I don't mean to be too, you know, uh, Pollyanna about this because, you know, I, I just think that if we keep focused on that and the more we can advance, um, the more providers, the more specialties, the more programs, we can get to that state where we've improved it the better off we're going to be. And we're going to continue to push for that. And I clearly recognize there are many areas where we're not there um, and there's still abrasion and there's still inefficiencies and there's still uh, issues as evidenced by like the IDR volume. Right. So, but we got to continue to focus on what can we do, what makes sense and what are the providers willing and members willing to accept um, at their speed on their terms that's the only way we're going to be successful is meeting them where they are and then providing them with opportunities that they want to engage in. Let me see if I can sneak one question in here and then we'll probably need to wrap up. I, the survey result on that previous one, I, 
the 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 answers were dominantly on the administrative cost um, sections, right? So we had labor costs in there and, and transformation costs in there. Those two choices were picked heavily um, over, for example, high cost patient um, therapy. I, so David, that first bullet point that that was on the slide as you talked about it, I you know David or Paul, um, what are you guys seeing? Whether it's gene therapy or GLP ones, like I, there's a lot of headline news on seven figure individual treatments about to hit on the market are we are we seeing that yet or perhaps it's um a little a little ahead of its time give me a give me a 30 second hot take go ahead paul yeah they're they're here um <laughs> we we've seen uh several of um look they're they're life changing um you know if you're talking about gene therapy um you know uh, specifically um so they're miraculous um and i think uh you know, in, in thinking about it, it's similar to the, uh, you know, the, the types of um, things you think about with any type of, um, you know, um, high cost uh, service, which is um, trying to do your best to contract to make sure that there's value provided for that service um, right up from up front. So um, if you have an extremely costly service, therapy, medication, making sure that there's a value-based component to your contract when you procure those types of services so that if it doesn't work, um, you know, there, there is, a, you know, financial repercussion for that on behalf of, you know, our, our customers, they would want that. Um, and then wrapping around programs to make sure that the right candidates um, you know, the, the right um, clinical indicators, you know, based on evidence-based medicine um, are present so that people who uh, need that therapy get it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think those are, you know, just similar things that have been around for a long time, but it's the execution of it. And it's also being prepared for that pipeline, I think, there's 11 more that are going to come out in the next two years that are multi-million dollars. And so getting in front of that right up front with programs to understand candidates um, and, uh, you know, who's right, how do you manage it is, is vital. Great. Yep. Get your reinsurance broker on, um, on speed dial too. Yeah, we will sell reinsurance for, uh, for gene therapy. So we are, we are actually selling that as well. All right, let me try and bring us home, guys. I think we're at the at the hour. I appreciate the dialogue. I think this was great, um, at least from my perspective. We'll get feedback from the audience. I'm um, in the survey that we send out afterwards. So please, you know, everyone out there, give us that feedback. I, you know, cost pressure, extreme, you know, on the industry, both from an admin cost perspective and a cost of care perspective, an increasingly complicated environment, an environment with increasing, you know, regulations that require investments to comply with, um, digital transformation themes, you know, providing an undercurrent to all of the above, right? We've got the, Paul, you commented on the use of technology as a as a critical component in solving for these items. And and then, you know, every every solution, you know, we're talking about has the risk of, you know, increasing complexity in the plan, but also perhaps, you know, disintermediating the relationship with the members so that that headline focus on member experience and making sure that the plan is front and center um, as, as we're making these um, evolutionary investments in, you know, our ability to care for the member control cost you know, critical as well over the top. So I, I think that's a capstone of, of the themes we talked about today. Appreciate everyone's time. I appreciate you hanging <laughs> out with us a bit beyond the survey and um, we'll get the survey out for folks to respond to feedback to our, our presentation today. And I think we've got some closing comments just to formally wrap up the webinar.